So, uh, so I have species named after me, and both our children have species named after them. And some of my girlfriends from university have species named after them. And so it became a, a little bit of a, of a bone of contention or a, of a teasing from my wife, Roberta, that I never named a species after her. And of course, this became a little bit competitive now because uh, Matthew had a genus named after him, Melinda had a whole family named. There was a certain standard that had to be kept up here. And I couldn't replicate, for example, my own experience of having the first species named after me being a parasitic flatworm from the stomach of a suckerfish. So I had to try and come up with something better than that. And it's taken uh, quite a long time to find the appropriate animal. I'm absolutely inspired by finding new species. I, I think one of the most exciting things that can happen to you as a biologist is to pick up an animal or look, into a, look at a sample and see an animal which you know nobody has ever seen before, or at least nobody has recognized. I grew up in, in Kenya. And every year we used to take our annual holidays and we would go down to the coast and stay uh, at Mombasa, which had the reef uh, literally at the bottom of the garden. So I, I grew up immersed in nature and I think I never really contemplated spending my life doing anything else than that. My dad never said, I don't know. He always said to me, well, let's go to the library and find out. So I, I guess we... We started doing, you know, amateur research at, at, a, at a kind of an early age. I'd lined up a PhD at the University of Canberra to study bats. And my parents were working in South Africa at the time. So I came in to spend a holiday with my parents. And one day on my way back from the beach, I bought a Natal Mercury. There was an advertisement for a job at UCT. In my university vacations, I'd volunteered in the zoology department to help the head of department, Professor John Day. In fact, advertised two jobs, and I was interested in the larval biology job. They'd already appointed somebody to that job, but I was, if I was interested in the other job, then they hadn't had any applications. So I asked him, well, what is the job? And he said, it's as an amphipod taxonomist. Do you, do you want it? And uh, I had never heard the word amphipod before, and I had no idea what they were. And I, I couldn't ask him that, because he would think that I was, I was totally stupid. So I just sort of dithered there for a minute. So after a few seconds, he said to me on the phone, well, come on, boy, do you want it or not? <laughs> so I just said, uh, Okay, I'll take it. So the interesting thing about that is the other job had been awarded to another uh, girl who just graduated with her master's degree, and she arrived in Cape Town at the same time that I did. So both of us were looking for a place to stay. And uh, we found an apartment which, with two other postgraduate students. And uh, yeah, that turned out to be my wife <laughs> at the end of the day office romance, if you like. It took a little time to warm up. <laughs> when I finished my PhD, the aim of which was to produce a guide to the amphipod species of South Africa, because I'd written the guide book, then many people would find animals and be unable to identify them with my guidebook. And so they would bring me specimens and then many times those specimens turned out to be new species to science. And it's very important that species have a designation and have a name because without things being named, 
you can't track what's happening to those populations and whether, for example, they're becoming extinct. And the more work we do on taxonomy, the more actually we realize how little we do know. Mm -hmm. You buy a guidebook and it has a whole lot of drawings or photographs in it and a whole lot of names. And one can get the impression that those are all the species that exist. If you collect a sample from deeper than a thousand meters, and the vast majority of the ocean is deeper than a thousand meters, then approximately 80% of all the animals that you collect are undescribed species. You know, then you find there are far more species than you ever thought existed. And uh, all of those need to be taken into consideration when you come to actually planning conservation. The format of describing and naming species was actually established by Linnaeus, a European scientist in the 1700s. And uh, it's basically a system of giving the animal an address. It's extremely similar to a postal address. So each family belongs to a major group of animals, which we call a phylum, like vertebrates would be a phylum, or mollusks would be a phylum. And that's like the, the country code on your address. And then within that phylum, there are various classes and families of animals which are similar to the city and then uh, within those there are genera of animals which is like the street that you live in and then within that genus there are many species and that's like that individual houses. The Latin name that's given to the animal is a genus name and a species name. So the genus name is like the name of the street and the species name is the house number on that street. So it individually identifies the animal. So to discover a new species in, in a biological sense, that what that actually involves is describing the organism and giving it a name. And uh, the name has to, has to meet a certain set of criteria. It has to be peer reviewed and published in a scientific journal and then the name becomes official and that animal joins the list of the known fauna of the world. But the actual words that you use to name those species can be almost anything. There are a few basic rules that like it can't be rude uh, or it can't be insulting of, of a person so you can't take uh, you know, a, a, a particularly ugly animal and, you know, name it after a politician, for example. Um, and you're not supposed to name things after yourself. It's uh, not ethical to name species after yourself. But other than that, uh, almost any word can be used. So the best species names, in my opinion, are those that actually give you uh, a way of remembering what species is being described. If the animal has three spines on its back, then you might call it trispinosa, for example, which is the Latin for tri is three, and spinosa is spines. So then you would always be able to remember that species. But many species are named after the places that they've been collected, or they're named in memory of family members or famous scientists who have worked in that field, for example, is a, is a very common thing. I've now added more than a hundred new species to the biodiversity of the planet and um, I've added another 200 species that were known elsewhere in the world to the fauna of South Africa and uh, I think that that's something which is a real kind of legacy uh, which, which, which is quite important to me. Um, and the, the other aspect of doing this type of work is essentially all of this work has involved students and uh, training students. I've trained thousands of undergraduate students over my 50-year career at, at the University of Cape Town. And all getting on towards 100 are over 90 masters or PhD students, many of whom have gone on to illustrious careers 
around the world in uh, the biological fields. But uh, taxonomic information remains valid for centuries. So it's a combination of uh, the taxonomic legacy and passing on the knowledge that I have uh, and the skills that I've learnt to another generation of not only taxonomists but scientists and other field are, are, are really what, what drives me, I guess. <laughs> yes, I, when I first started naming species, and uh, bear in mind that I was a fairly rural PhD student at that time, I started naming them after girlfriends that I had. But of course, at that point in my life, I didn't anticipate that I would describe over a hundred species and that, that I would soon run out of options. <laughs> <laughs> there are several species that are named after me and it's not because I was a boyfriend or a girlfriend. So yes, the first species that was named after me is actually a parasitic flatworm from the stomach of a sucker fish. <laughs> so I'm very proud of that one. <laughs> I was doing or had a student who was doing a project on sucker fish and the diets of suckerfish, in fact. So we were opening the stomachs of the suckerfish, and I noticed these flatworms, and I sent them to the scientist in the UK, and he kindly named the species after me. <laughs> Subsequent to that, I've had several other species that have been named after me, which are perhaps a little bit more significant, so which are two, two of which are amphipods, which are the group of animals which I've specialized in working in. There is some sense of immortality in having a species named after you, as m most of these species names have persisted unchanged for centuries. So there are many names that were given, uh, many times named after other scientists back in the 1700s, which are still in use and, and really perpetuate the name of that person throughout history. Going out and, and searching for, for new species is often uh, a whole lot of fun, but there have also been some accidental discoveries along the way, and uh, the, the most famous and oft quoted of, of these is that uh, when my son Matthew was three or four years old, then uh, we went on holiday to Nisner. We were going up one of the mountain passes behind Nisner, and then Matthew wanted to go for a pee on this narrow mountain road. So after a few hundred meters, I managed to find a tiny little pull-in where I could pull off the road. And Matthew disappeared behind a bush to do his business. Um, but like any good biologist, I, of course, had my little hand net tucked behind the seat of my combi. So while Matthew was busy, I had a little scratch in the, in the stream that was running. Uh, through this pull-off, and there were some amphipods in there, well outside the known range of this group of animals. So I just put them in a tube and with some alcohol and brought them back to Cape Town. And when I got back to Cape Town and looked at them, they were not only an unknown species of amphipod, a freshwater amphipod, but it was an entirely new genus of amphipods. And so I named that genus after Matthew. The uh, name of the family is Paramelitidae, and my son's name is Matthew. So I called them Matthew's Melita, Mathamelita. So Mathamelita is still a genus of amphipods with only one species in it, and that species has only ever been found once, and that was on this little... A family holiday that we were on when he was a few years old. And then my daughter Melinda has a sea slug or nudibranch named after her. And she's uh, even at a more elevated status because you get a species named after you or you can get a genus named after you. But very rarely you can actually get an entire family of animals named after you. So like the Proteacea, for example, 
My wife, Roberta, was also a marine biologist, and she discovered and named the species of sea slug after Melinda. The name Melinda is what taxonomists call preoccupied. In other words, there is already a genus of some other animal that's called Melinda. So Melinda is preoccupied, so Roberta had to switch the letters around, and uh, the genus is called Liminda. So Liminda malicra is a genus and species of sea slug, very beautiful one that's named after Melinda, and it's in its own unique family, the Lemindidae. But uh, for many years, there was no species named after my wife, and this became a little bit of, a, of a, an issue that she would tease me about. So there were other reasons why I wanted to uh, speed this process up and get a, a species out that was named after Roberta. Um, one of the reasons is that I was retiring, and then it actually happened that at that time, Roberta got diagnosed with ovarian cancer. So uh, it was particularly appropriate at that time to actually produce a, a, a legacy which would, which would live on. What actually happened in this instance was that one of my postgraduate students was doing a study on the fauna of kelp beds and I was helping her to identify some of the species. And in one of the samples, there was an amphipod which I was unable to identify, just a single specimen. So uh, I'd, know, I'd known exactly where that specimen had been collected. So uh, Roberta and, and I actually went out on a kayak and resampled the kelp, um, the kelp stipes in that exact area. And we indeed did find some holes in the kelp and inside those holes were these amphipods. And what one has to do in this case is, first of all, I ran specimens through the identification guide to South African amphipods, which fortunately I had written myself as part of my PhD and was quite definitely not there. So the next step is to, to, to ask the question, well, maybe it's an amphipod that's known from elsewhere in the world and it just hasn't been found in South Africa before. One can almost always identify these animals to genus. So you would recognize a sparrow or a hawk or a, uh, an owl, for example. So then I had to, to find the descriptions of all the other amphipods in that genus that have ever been described in the world. Uh, so there can easily be 300 species in a single genus and some of them would have been described in Russian or uh, Chinese or Japanese and in journals that come from those countries. So it can be very difficult. Uh, or it can be very easy in that there may be only one or two existing species in that genus. So this was kind of an intermediate case and very luckily a scientist from New Zealand had recently done another paper in which she'd reviewed the group and described some new species from Australia and New Zealand. So uh, using her paper and a few other resources that I could get from the internet, I could quite easily establish that the species had not been described from elsewhere. Um, and it also had unique habits. There's only one other species that's known to burrow into kelp, and that comes from North America, and it has quite different anatomical features. Uh, having established that, then one has to write a proper formal species description. And this is basically just a written account of what the animal looks like, which is accompanied by photographs or drawings of the structures of the animal and uh, a written argument in which you explain why you are sure that this animal is not the same as any of the existing ones. And then that description and those illustrations have to be published in a peer-reviewed journal and only when they've been approved by one's peers and properly published in the journal 
does the species name become official. So I wanted to find something that was meaningful to name after Roberta. The first projects that Roberta and I did together when we were both working at UCT was a thing called the Kelp Bed Project. So we worked for several years together on kelps. And then uh, I, I did, had done my PhD on amphipods and Roberta had helped me a lot with the field work for that project. So both kelp and amphipods had a significance between us. So having an amphipod that burrowed into kelp kind of molded those two themes together and made a very suitable species. And it was also uh, quite a spectacular looking amphipod with very interesting habits, which maybe Roberta has as well. <laughs> so uh, a few years ago I did a secretly write up and publish a paper describing the species after Roberta. It's called Sun Amphitoe Roberta. And uh, then I made a nice framed photograph of the species and attached a little vial to it with one of the original specimens of that species. And then I presented it to her as a birthday present. She really got very emotional and excited about it. So I think it was something which had been uh, on her mind for, for quite a few years. And uh, she thought maybe that I would retire and forget about her. So <laughs> she was pretty excited that uh, I'm, I'd, I'd managed to uh, squeeze it in there and in secret and get the species out without her knowing about it. Another interesting aspect of adding this species with Roberta's name in it is it now means that we are a family of four and all four members of the family actually have species named after them. And in the end we actually had a front page article on the Sunday Times and a photograph of the family with each holding a photograph of, of the species that was named after them. So it was, it was quite a media event. I go to work every day because I, I love it. I mean, it's, it's what gives meaning to my life. So it's, I'm definitely not one of these people who uh, says uh, TGIF. <laughs> my whole career has been something which um, I've been extremely grateful that somebody has been willing to pay me to do it, but somewhat surprised. Um, but it's something that I really do because of the pleasure that I get out of it. And that pleasure not only comes from, from discoveries made, but from uh, students trained. It's a very fulfilling thing to uh, see people that you've interacted with and helped along with their careers go out and, and make a name for themselves. There's not much more, more rewarding than that. So I'm very happy that I've been able to name species after my son and now after my wife and she in turn named the species after our daughter. So essentially we're all, we're all going to live on through history as our little crawling around creatures in the ocean. <laughs> We have a tradition of birthday cards in our family and this is the last birthday card that my mom gave to me. And in it she said, Dearest Matthew, it has given dad and me great pleasure to watch your developing interest in marine life in the past few years. We have a lifetime of shore visits but still find every one a new experience. For us, it is food for the soul and mind and it is also great fun. Personally, I wonder at the beauty of the shapes, colors, patterns, and behavior of the animals and their design for survival in this habitat. The changing moods of the ocean and the populations of animals provide something new to see and learn. Perhaps you now understand our passion for the ocean and its shores. Enjoy your shore visits. Much love from Mum, Dad, and Benjamin. Hello Matt, good morning. Good morning, good morning. It's Happy your birthday. birthday. To you. Happy birthday, birthday to you. To you. No, I don't think we could sing much further. <laughs> We're not Have very good day. at singing.
Have a good day. <coughs> I look forward to seeing you later. Yeah, you're still a spring chicken too. You don't need to feel old today. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy. Enjoy the day. Hope it goes well. See you later. Lots yeah. of love. Bye.